Thanks for welcoming me. It's really cool. It's really great to be here. It's an awesome opportunity. Thanks for coming to hear me talk. And I hope at the end you'll let me know if any of these ideas are feel relevant to things you're working on or not. Um, so kind of the outline of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about like my background and perspective. Um, and then I'm going to show um, a project about clocks and have you um, do a little magic trick with it that will involve you. And then um, I'm going to try to tie that into like a, a larger story at the end. So that's kind of the overall outline. Um, but yeah, clocks, deception, and what happens when you impose regularity on a subtle mess. So uh, my background as an undergraduate, I studied physics and literary arts, kind of like totally separately. People would often ask me, like, what are you doing with both of them? And they would say something like, well, maybe you're trying to write science fiction, and that's why you're doing both of these things. Um, I didn't really know how to answer them. I just was interested in both of those things at the time. Now I kind of want to think about uh, science and poetry as um, two kinds of language practices. Um, I guess in part because like the artifacts that you produce in both of these disciplines uh, are mostly these like language artifacts. They look kind of similar. They're mostly like um, organizations of language on paper. Um, there's a bunch of differences too. So let's talk about some of the differences. And there's also, I mean, some of the differences are about the expectations of like the work that goes into, or the activities that you do um, while you're working on like producing these artifacts. But at the end of the day, it's like you're, you're arranging language and then presenting it to people. Um, so some of the ways of characterizing these, um, in science, there's like a predetermined form. Um, usually it involves like an abstract and then um, a ending in a conclusion, but also like the way that you um, are stringing language together is usually involves like proposition and then another proposition and then another proposition. And this is like, the this is the structure that you use. There's not much um, wiggle room when it comes to this. Um, it's also a really goal-oriented uh, kind of language production, and the goal is like persuasion. So you, the question you might ask to determine uh, success is, uh, are you convinced reading it? Like, has it succeeded in persuading you? And there's not a lot of other questions I think you might ask. Um, and part of uh, the way the persuasion works is by privileging rationality but this is, I think, uh, kind of coincidental. So it has to do with the fact that today, the best way to convince people of things is to appeal to reason. Maybe in another time, there were other things, uh, other ways of convincing people of things. And maybe Mary knows about some of those other ways of convincing people. I hope to talk to you about that. Um, OK, so now poetry. And when I say poetry, I'm really thinking of like the most general form of poetry. So I'm not really thinking about like all the kinds of poetry that do have a predetermined form that you're working in, but just like uh, you could replace poetry with like literary art or language art as a broad, a broad category. So in poetry, the form is part of the play. And you're working with, instead of working with propositions, you're kind of working with just language and you're playing with language. And when you're reading the poem, it's teaching you how to read it. It's not determined ahead of time that, oh, yeah, you're going you're gonna to say this, and then this is going to logically follow this, and then this is going to logically follow this. Instead, you're like reading it and trying to figure out, how do I interpret this thing? How do I make it make sense? Um, and I want to say it's more process-oriented. So, the questions you might ask to determine whether it's like working are, are you having fun? Like, am I able to, in this process of reading it or writing it, am I able to um, play with it? Am I feeling anything? Less so about uh, persuasion or convincing someone of something at the end of the, of the reading or the writing. And rationality is one possible way you might string together things in a poem. Um, but nonsense is like a 
perfectly acceptable other mode that you might use. Um, I kind of think a useful analogy, and like maybe like a deep analogy, is switching the headings from science and poetry to playing chess and playing pretend. When you're playing chess, it's like the rules are set up, the goals are set up, you're making these moves. When you're playing pretend, you imagine when you're a kid, um, you're at the playground and then you're deciding in that moment, um, what do I want to what do I want to play with, and what meaning do I, what meaning do I want to make out of it? I think that's like a, uh, essentially the, the the crux of the distinction I'm trying to make. So, and this is like one lens of viewing these things. This is not like the truth about science and poetry. This is just one lens that I'm going to try to figure out if this is like a useful lens. So, I'm sort of characterizing this like spectrum of rhetoric with science on the one hand and poetry or language art on the other hand. And my particular interest is like in stuff that's in the middle of this spectrum. And hopefully by the end, uh, there will be some clues as to why I think this is interesting. Um, but that's sort of what I'm like working through and figuring out now. OK, so now onto this like uh, clock project I was working on. This is my friend Michael Sumner, and he's pointing at these um, beautiful shapes that he's made. He's a graphic designer in New Mexico. And he printed out these large shapes. He actually made this uh, design system. So there's like a, a system that kind of generates these that he is working with. You can maybe kind of get a sense of what it might be. Um, there's like these circles involved, and they're stacked on each other. Um, so if you uh, are game, would you pull up on your phone this URL. So this will take you to the, the project I'm working on. So it's two.compost.digital. And then you'll see this. And then if you scroll down, you'll get to this one, clock basket number one, with my name. And you can tap that one. I'll do it too. So you should see something that looks kind of like these shapes when you do eventually get there. And if you, has, has who's found it, who's been able to get there successfully? You got there. OK, and if you tap it, you'll, you'll see it uh, sort of uh, change. Oh yeah, I forgot I'm going to pull up over here. So this is like the home page of this magazine. And then if you click on this one, here you are. And if you tap on this thing, it'll sort of morph between these um, drawings. And there is a begin button at the bottom. Um, so there's a story that goes with this thing. I'm not going to spend that much time on the story, um, but it's there. I encourage you to read it. Um, so you might notice that every time you like touch this thing, it's a totally different drawing that comes up. I mean, it's within this like family of shapes, but they're all it's it's random every time. So here's the, 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 the family of shapes that Michael came up with is created with, there's this like big circle in the background, which maybe you can see. And then there's these four smaller circles that span the um, inside of the bigger circle. And then there's these sort of three medium sized ones and two slightly bigger ones. And then he cuts the whole thing in half. So really, instead of having 10 circles, there are 20 half circles. And then each of those can be black or white. And that's like the whole family of these possible shapes. So there's about a million different ones. 
Okay, so then, time for the magic trick. So you, you have this thing up. Um, so normally when you tap it, it's like generating these random configurations, but the magic is if I'm going to count down from five, and on one, everyone tap it at the same time on their device. Okay, so I'll do five, four, three, two, and then on one, we all press it. Okay, so five, four, three, two, one. Oh, I should have done it on the, hold on. Oh, let me do it on here. <laughs> Let's do it one more time. This is part of the trick. He's trying to flex it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, one more time. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so, uh, look at your neighbor's phone and compare images. You might notice that they're the same or very similar. Tell me what you're seeing. Are yours the same? Yeah. They are, okay. And were yours the same? No, it's similar. Almost, almost similar, similar. okay, similar. yeah. Okay, we'll do it. Uh, so, maybe think about how this might be happening for a second. And then, um, if you want, turn off, put your phone in airplane mode, and then we'll do it one more time. So I'll count down, I'll give you time to put it in airplane mode, and then um, we'll do it one more time. So, ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So I'm not going to. I'm not going to give away. Maybe it might be very obvious. Some some people when they see this are like, oh yeah, it's clearly this is how it's working. Other people, uh, it's like a more magical experience. But we'll I'll come back to it in the end. But that's the uh, that's the magic trick. Okay. So I had this problem of there were these like a million different uh, possible combinations of Michael circles. And I wanted, to, I wanted to show him all of them. That was the, really the main motivation of this. I saw this design he was working with, and I wanted to show him like the totality of the design he had made. So I was like, maybe I'll make a movie of all these circles. But the movie would last, I think, like 14 days or something, because there's just so many of them. So I thought, maybe instead of a movie, um, there's a way to like, make these into a clock. And so I started researching like time and clocks. And this is my fa one of my favorite sculptures in Oakland, where I'm from. So I live in California. Mm, and this is sort of by the water. It's by this sculptor, Roger Berry. And it's designed so that on the summer solstice, it's these like two cones hanging. And on the summer solstice, only the inside of this large cone is illuminated. It, this, this path like, traces the sun on the longest day. And on the winter solstice, uh, only the inside of this cone is illuminated. And I had no idea, I mean, I had seen the shadows change uh, throughout the year, kind of, I guess. But honestly, I was kind of blind to a lot of like, seasonality until I saw this thing. And then I was like, wow, the sun moves from being over here to like being over here in the sky. I mean, I had truly really heard this, but this like really made me see it on the ground, like visualize it, I guess. And that's part of why I really like that sculpture. Um, so I started researching time. And I felt deceived by the end of it, because I kept learning these things that didn't make sense with what I thought, the way I thought time worked. And one of the things was how many degrees the Earth rotates in a day. I was like, surely it's 360 degrees. The sun rises, the sun sets. That must be how many degrees are in a day. It turns out that's not the case. The Earth rotates like slightly more than 360 degrees in a day. And this was like the first deception where I was like, something strange is going on. The reason it's slightly more than 360 degrees is that if the Earth were not going around the sun and it rotated 360 degrees, fine, that would be a day. The sun would be directly overhead as it was moving the previous day. But because the, the Earth has moved a little bit, after 360 degrees, the sun is not directly overhead at this point anymore. The Earth has to go a little bit further for, the, for, no, for noon to have occurred again. Because it's kind of like started this journey around the sun. So when I saw that, I was like, something fishy is going on as far as like my mental model of time and like what's really going on in the universe. 
Um, and then it turns out, in part because of this fact, and then also um, like the amount of this orbit, this like arc in the orbit, because it's an ellipse, it changes throughout the year. So actually, not only is the number of degrees this strange number, um, the number of hours in the day varies throughout the year. So this is like a plot of day length over days in the year. So in uh, between like March and April, we have the <coughs> shortest days. And this is not about hours of sunlight. We know that like in winter there's not much sun, and in summer there's a lot of sun. This is about like actually how many seconds pass from noon to noon changes throughout the year. And that I thought was really strange also, because I was sure that my clock only read 24 hours. So how could there be other amounts of seconds passing throughout the day? So this is like deception number two, I guess, in my learning about time. It turns out that 24 hours is the average length of a day, which is why it kind of works out. But from day to day, the actual number of seconds is fluctuating. So but there's like something, there's, there's all problems. Um, one of them is that we, we make these like clocks more and more accurate. And we're really proud of that. And we can do phenomenal things with accurate clocks. And this is like, this is uh, one of the places where like time, official time is kept uh, in this US Naval Observatory. So this is like an array, a bank of atomic clocks. And in the atomic clocks, these atoms are vibrating and they're counting the vibrations. And this is how we get like really accurate measures of time. So accurate meaning, I mean like, a, 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 well you probably know if you, well maybe you don't know. But if you had like a, a watch with a spring, eventually it would like start slowing down and you'd be off time, you'd need to resynchronize it. And maybe you can do better with like a bigger spring or with a piece of quartz or something. We're always trying to like make these clocks that uh, won't go off, won't be off. And so th this is like the culmination of that today. These clocks, it'll take millions of years before they go off by a second or a millisecond even. So like, wow, what an achievement. But it doesn't really help to have uh, really good clocks if like the stuff that you're measuring is not that regular. So uh, you probably know about leap years. Every four years is a leap year, and that is because uh, the, the Earth, in its path around the sun, doesn't complete exactly 365 rotations. It completes 365 and a quarter. So if you wait four years, and then you add a day, it kind of balances out. That's cool. It's kind of convenient that it's 365 and a quarter. If it was like 365 and like some strange fraction, it would be kind of maybe more complicated to make that work out. But there's also these things called leap seconds, which I didn't know about. And there's this whole institution called the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service. And one of their responsibilities is to decide when do we need to add a leap second to the clock. And they decide like six months in advance. And sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't happen. And the, the reason they add these leap seconds is in part because the, the speed that the Earth is rotating, it slows down or it, it changes over time. Sometimes it changes simply because of the, the oceans like dragging it, sort of, if you can imagine like um, trying to spin something and the oceans are like resisting the rotation of the Earth. Sometimes it changes speed because of things that we do, like build a giant dam that's like big enough to change the distribution of mass on the Earth, and then that changes the speed of the rotation of the Earth. So in order to make this system uh, work for us, we have this body dedicated to like adding these little corrections periodically. And this is the kind of, so twice, I guess, I think a couple times a year they release these bulletins. So it's addressed to authorities responsible for the measurement and distribution of time. No leap second will be introduced at the end of December 2021. Uh, the difference between coordinated universal time and the international atomic time is from 2017, January 1st, zero hours UTC until further notice, minus 37 seconds. Um, 
and then they talk about when the next bulletin will come out. So this is like, well, there's like an institution that's responsible for sending these out all the time. And this it says from 2017 because this was the last year that a leap second was introduced. So we've been in kind of like a dry spell of leap seconds. <laughs> and it says minus 37 seconds here because they're keeping track of how many leap seconds have been introduced since the system was first in place. So they're keeping track of like the time system that does not have leap seconds, uh, which would be this uh, atomic time, TAI. And then universal time is the atomic time, the time measured by these things, plus all of the, all of the leap second bulletins that they have sent out. OK, so I, was, I did this research. I learned these like, surprising things. I felt like what people had told me about time was wrong this whole time. But I also felt a little silly to even um, expect that, like, why did I think anything different? These just rocks tumbling through space. Like they don't care at all whether their rotations line up with each other. Like it, uh, there's nothing at stake for the rock to be legible in terms of other rocks' rotations. So on the one hand, I felt silly, and on the other hand, I felt uh, tricked, I guess, or lied to. Um, and then I started thinking about how it's like, well, what a human thing to do to like for there to be this complicated system and to be like, I'm going to reduce this complicated system into something that I can make use of and work with. Like how human to create this perfect uh, atomic clock that never loses a second. Um, and then for it to be, for it to require all this baggage to make it actually usable. Because it's like we can only make sense of things when we do this uh, abstraction or reduction of them. Otherwise, they're too difficult to think about, I guess. So there's like reasons for it. But this is sort of like the thing that I'm fundamentally, fundamentally interested in, I think, and why I'm interested in um, going back to the original context, like kinds of communication between uh, the more rigid science and the more like playful poetry. Uh, so it's like you, you see this, like, this thing you're amazed by, this like beautiful construction with all this detail in it. And then in order to work with it, you, you draw a picture of it or you smooth it out. You figure out like, what are the features that I care about, I guess. And this is like, I think this is like classical reduction, but it's like the only way we have to think about things, I think, or this is what I'm wondering. And part of, part of the classic story is, not only do you make an abstraction of the thing, but you have to retell, you have to recreate the abstraction over and over again. Because as soon as you stop doing that, um, it doesn't have any meaning anymore. And this is kind of, I like the atomic clock example because it's really obvious here. Like as soon as they stop sending these bulletins, the system, the abstraction is gone, I guess. Like they have to keep, uh, they have to keep doing this literally every time. But I think this, this kind of, um, breakdown of how it works is applicable to other kinds of abstractions that are less um, obvious than this one. Like any kind of story you tell about um, why you're here or like what this institution is for, you have to keep telling it or you'll start to make a new kind of sense out of the thing. And I really like this part of the bulletin. Maybe this is kind of unique to the clock instance that they're really, there's like this paper trail. They're keeping track of the accumulation of all of the adjustments they had to make. They were remembering, this is how many leap seconds we've had. This is like, this is how many times we've had to redo the, um, the reduction. So, Yeah, so I guess the, I think in this region, in between, you can get a lot, you can get a lot done with science and with all these rules and working with propositions. There's a reason why it's like successful and effective. And then you can get a lot of other th kinds of things done with poetry. And I feel like there's a really fruitful area in between where you're mixing like 
some of the techniques here and some of the techniques over there and some of the concerns here and some of the concerns over there. And I think, I think this is fruitful because I think like this is how maybe to get, or this is how I, I, I want to get a better idea of like this process. Because there are such, there are two like different ends of this like um, way of thinking about things. So maybe by going in the middle and messing around in there, we'll get a better understanding of one or the other. This is kind of like a, I feel like this is the softest part of this presentation. So let me know if, if you have any tips for directions to go, I guess after saying this, but this is the end. Um, some people that I'm wanting to read in this area are, are Donna Haraway talking about worlding, and Flu Dylan Flusser talking about abstraction, and I think David Graeber, the anthropologist, had a lot of interesting things to say about what happens when you do this like reduction of humans. Um, yeah, but that's all. Thank you.